Good evening, YouTubers. This is going to be a video on some of the weeks, events, and, and things I saw on YouTube. Mostly things in the news and, and kind of commentary on YouTube, stuff like that. I was watching, I want to get this off my chest, I was watching uh, Michael Malice interview, I believe it's Justin Amash, he retired, I can't remember, if, I think he was a congressman, or he might, he might have been a, I uh, forget, anyways, he was, he was one of those political, one of the few political people in the United States who's kind of a libertarian and anyways he was he was in a public office I think about 10 years or 12 years I can't remember but Michael was asking him what's the biggest thing average people perceive that's not true about Congress and what he said did not surprise me, but and it's kind of what I've said a long, for a long time. But then I'll tell you one thing he did say that did surprise me that I did not know. It's always nice when you learn something new. Anyways, what Justin Amash said, he said um, that the political divide you see in Congress really isn't as bad as people think. He's not saying, he didn't mean to suggest they always get along and they're the best of friends. But what he said was, like I say in my videos, it's mostly a Punch and Judy show for entertainment. Just as an example, Michael Mouse was saying, we all know wrestling is choreographed. Uh, I'm, I'm searching for another word. I can't think of it right now. Um, but it's all planned out. They know who the winners and losers are going to be, generally speaking. It, it's mainly scripted. That's what I want to use, scripted. And we know in advance, well, in general, they have an outline. They decide who's going to win, who's going to be the bad guy, how it's all going to work out. And in general, most of the American public knows that. <laughs> now, in another life, I had a girlfriend. She thought it was real. It's kind of funny watching her watch wrestling, but that's another story for another time. <laughs> Anyways, um... What he said was, when they're up, when they're on their committees or their subcommittees, and they're being, they're interviewing witnesses and stuff like that. Here's what I did not know, which I shouldn't really be surprised, but I am a little surprised. He said they're giving, they're all the congressmen are giving the are given the questions to ask the other side. Or to ask witnesses and things like that so he said like for example in his case he was told he need to ask these questions and this is what we're gonna do and he said this is what the other side is gonna say so they all know this all in advance it's all choreographed the fake anger and all that kind of thing and he said he wouldn't do it so in his case he lost quite a few committees and then the one he was on, which was a very, very minor one, he wasn't allowed to ask questions, or he was allowed questions, but last, so he couldn't really, because he didn't want to play ball, he said. That did not surprise me, because the establishment wants things to go a certain way, and he didn't want to cooperate. He openly said he didn't want to cooperate, so they didn't let him ask his questions. So in general, there's no surprise questions or, or anything like that. The, the other side is... They have scripted answers. They have scripted questions. They, they, they go back and forth on witnesses and, and, and stuff like that. So it was really, really fascinating. Really, really fascinating. And how, how what's my, I, I'm kind of leading up to a point. Here's, here's my point. The country itself, the everyday men and women are equally divided in, in the United States. I'll just speak for the United States. And I think in general, this is true of a lot of Western Europe or Western countries just in general. I think that's why we had Brexit. That's why we had Donald Trump elected. That's why we have the yellow vests in France. 
that's not even really done yet, but we're not hearing about it much anymore because of COVID-19. Um, anyways, the countries are now more and more divided in the West. The politicians, they pretend to do a Punch and Judy show and not, not get along. But privately, like Justin Amasha says, they come together, they work out deals and things like that. So that's what I think is going on. And I, find, I just find that fascinating. Now, there's a few other things I want to comment on. Just as, just a general statement on the loss of privacy, the loss of liberty, in, excuse me, in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, especially, especially the United Kingdom. I would say Western Europe, again, I'm only generalizing, it's only my opinion, how, has, has, has seen a loss of freedom and liberty for maybe longer than the Commonwealth countries like the United States. Well, it's not really a Commonwealth, but Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc., etc. Now, even in Western Europe, there's kind of, um, I would say, I personally would say there's a few countries that aren't too bad or they're less bad, I would say. Like, for example, if I personally had to live in, in, in in Western Europe, and I could live wherever I want. I would live in Liechtenstein or Switzerland, and that's only because, in general, there's there's more freedom and liberty. Especially when it comes to your personal wealth, your bank accounts, privacy matters, and things like that. But even in in most of Western Europe, you don't have you you don't have an expectation to have personal privacy anymore, in my opinion. But it can be worse in other countries. That's that's all I mean. Anyways, I, I, from time to time I get comments on where this is all headed and like there's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide anymore, which is partly true, I think, because people ask me, they ask other people like, well, what's the solution to this problem? Like 15, 20 years ago, I said, well, the solution is if you're in Western Europe or the United States or Canada, well, way, way, way back when I was a kid, I would have said, just go to Canada, just go to Australia. They have a lot more freedom and liberty. I'm talking like 30, 40 years ago. I mean, I'm talking a long time ago. But basically, just leave. And then later on, I would I would have said, and other commentators would have said, well, just leave. But instead of going there to the countries I just mentioned, you would go to Latin America or Asia or even Eastern Europe You know, after the wall came down and stuff like that. And there's even parts of, of Africa and parts of the Middle East that, that are kind of interesting that, that really people don't talk about. I'm trying to think of, of, it's not coming to mind. It's not, it's not a country in Africa. It's, it's in the Middle East, I think. The geography isn't the best, but I can't, I think it's Oman. I'm not exactly sure the location of Oman, but a place like Oman, Oman is still interesting if you can get a visa. And you have a skill that's in demand there that you can earn a good living there. The reason I mention is because some of these Middle Eastern countries are still kind of in the Stone Age. And in general, as someone from the West, I don't want to live in a country that's in the Stone Age. But the upside is when you bank in those countries, your wealth is really your wealth. In those countries, you can hold gold and your gold is your gold. And that's one of the big reasons. And a lot of the kingdoms in the Arab world are very, very low tax or no tax at all. They're either the tax is zero or very, very little. So because they're kingdoms, they're kind of like the way Europe used to be hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The king owns everything and all that kind of jazz. So there's not a there's not a big he's not influenced to, to overtax the citizens. You know, if you think of it, you know, he owns them. If you tax them high, they're not going to produce very much. I know that's not politically correct, but if he's going to give away his wealth to his kids. He wants that wealth to grow, grow, and grow, and be bigger and bigger, so you wouldn't want to tax it. We're like in the Western world. We're all free now, allegedly. So there's no incentive for the state to have low tax. There's every incentive because governments change every four years or six years or two years, depending on where you're at. There's every incentive to, in, to spend as much as you can, borrow as much as you can, and raise taxes as much as you can, to get as much as you can before the whole thing collapses. Whereas, in, at least in some parts of the world, there's still kingdoms, like in in the Arab world. I'll just put that in the Arab world. 
um, there's less of an incentive to destroy the productive value of the country and the people inside the country. That's why I say that. And they have a history or a tradition of lower tax. They have a tradition and history of, of at least legal ownership of gold so you can protect yourself. But there's also two drawdowns there. They're, they're very traditional type societies. If you're not flexible and you can't fit in as a foreigner, you would have a hard time living there. In some of those countries like Saudi Arabia, it's, it's well, it used to be nearly impossible to get a visa, but recently they opened up the country to tourism, but that could change. I personally wouldn't live in the kingdom there. I would, I would prefer Oman. And there's some unique things going on there that I'm, I'm aware of. That's the only reason I pick it. It's not like I picked it out of, of somewhere, but anyways, kind of got off track. I got off, I got off topic there, but anyways, the, the typical answer before is, well, if things are bad in the West, just leave. But everywhere you go nowadays, I don't want to say the police state's going there, but what I really want to say is technology is going to all these places. So the Chinese credit system that they have is being exported to places like Australia. Places a good a good example right now is Cambodia. Cambodia just well made up known. Maybe this has been more known, but the, now it's really out there that they put a filter on their internet. So Cambodia is now like China, where if you don't have a VPN. You're not going to be able to access the internet or all the internet websites you want to outside of if you're inside Cambodia now. More and more countries are doing it. I would say Western countries do it. People just aren't aware of it. And Western countries are nowhere near where China is or Cambodia or Saudi Arabia. I, I forgot to mention them, but a lot of these countries have these filters on so you can't access websites around the world. And that's the big problem now. So no matter where you go, you have all you have AI technology that's getting better and better and better. You have all this cheap technology that's getting cheaper and cheaper, so it's more and more affordable for governments to implement it. And now you have more I don't want to say cooperation exactly, but you have more governments looking at what China is doing, how successful, how they're not. You have governments looking at what Saudi Arabia did to some of their dissidents and how that worked or how it didn't work. So now you have countries kind of, well, if Saudi Arabia can do that, we can do that. If China, Cambodia can filter their, their internets, then Western countries are going to start doing that. I mean, I think we're starting to see the early beginnings of that. And as it gets cheaper and cheaper from a technological point of view for countries and corporations to do this, you would expect, you would expect countries and corporations to spy on their citizens more. I mean, I remember 10, maybe 10 years ago or five years ago in the United States, it wasn't maybe not common knowledge, but you knew if you're in a big city, the minute you get onto the freeway, your license plate is entered. It's, there's a picture of it, of it. It's entered in computer and, and it tells you where you got on the freeway, where you got off. And then as you pass through lights on, on, the main thoroughfares, they can track you that way. That's just from your car. They can also track you by your phone, your iPhone. They can ping your iPhone very, very easily, and it's more and more accurate. Now, as time progresses, it gets more and more accurate. And I don't know if it was in the last five years or ten years. It could have been longer, but recently the government, at least in the United States, announced that they can track all your financial transactions right at the moment they happen. Not like 10 hours later or 12, they, they can track all that right now in real time. They know what citizens are doing. Like the minute you use your ATM card in another country, they know. The minute you use it across the country, they know. The minute you use it somewhere else, they know. And it's getting harder and harder to cloak those kinds of things. And now they have AI software that really tracks you, predicts what you're going to do or not do. They have software that can predict, like, if they think you're going to commit a crime based on what you've said and done in the past. Now, keep in mind, Facebook, Amazon, YouTube, they claim not to do this, but they, when your microphone and your cameras and your computers are on, 
they track you and they listen to you. Now there's certain things you can do to turn that off. I'm not saying you can't, but but it's now pretty well known, well known that they do. That's how they know what to market to you. They are taking all this data and they're just compiling it and compiling it and they're having AI go through it and go through it and go through it. And they can predict what you're going to buy before you buy it. They can predict if you're going to have an affair. They can predict who you might have an affair with. They can predict, this is really, this has been talked about before, but they can predict when women have babies before they have babies. It's just, it's fascinating what they can predict with this AI software. So you can imagine in the future, they're going to say, well, hey, if we're going to predict these guys are going to protest this action, we better shut these guys down before we announce our new law or our new whatever. This is what's really creepy and, and frightening about our future. So when I say, like, what's the solution? I don't personally have an easy solution for anyone. And I, I think people have to decide for themselves how much they can tolerate of this. I can just say if you go offshore to a like a developing country that's less developed, this stuff is coming too, but it's just going to come later, like 20, 30 years later. And it won't be as enforced. And there'll be a lot of wiggle room to get around a lot of this stuff. But eventually, it'll it'll be just like the United States or China. And that's why I say, like, if you're going to live in a big city in any country, this is where all this stuff's going to happen in any country anywhere in the world. So anywhere in the world, if you can go to a smaller community, you're going to have less of it following you and tracking you. Just because you're living out in the middle of nowhere or, you know, in a rural area meaning Canada or the United States, or meaning Mexico even, or Guatemala. Now, in the past, I would say I can never imagine that happening here in Guatemala, but I'll tell you what happened recently. This is just a clue. I don't think this is a predictor of anything. I'm just saying a clue. And this is one of many clues. I'm not claiming one clue means a trend. But just recently in Guatemala, they're proposing that taxi drivers have insurance. Maybe people don't know this, but... Maybe there's a law, maybe there's not. I don't think there's a law that says you have to have insurance, but there might be. Well, now they're going to start trying to make these laws and enforce them on people. That's going to drive up the cost of living. That's going to mean that if you don't have insurance, you can't drive or you have to bribe the police. That just makes the economy more inefficient and, and makes things big, big problems. So they're protesting that here. That's just one of many things going on here. What I see as a bigger picture type thing is more and more first world countries are going to have more strings attached to aid to the developing world where they have to implement all these measures so they can get the whole world like on this path to you know having a having your your phone tracked anywhere you go in the world your bank accounts tracked anywhere you go in the world you know having a so-called covid passport or an immunization passport so you have two documents your passport and your immunization passport and if you don't have both of them you can't travel. That's what I see happening. Now, ultimately, I think in some parts of the world, this will all collapse because the economies are going to not collapse, but slowly wind down. And then c countries, politicians, and citizens will have a decision to make. Will they go down the path of China and keep, you know, enslaving people, or will they let liberty spring up? I think you're just going to see different regions do different things, and, and I don't, think I'm a good predictor of who will do what. I can just say it will be harder to implement this stuff like in some of the Commonwealth countries and maybe easier to do in some of the Western European countries. But even there, even then I'm not confident that I'm right even there, but it seems like the will of most people is sapped right now. It seems like most people want to be on some kind of government aid program. I'm not trying to badmouth people. I'm just saying people prefer it to, to working and being an entrepreneur or being productive. And it seems really easy just to, I'll get my vaccine, I'll get my, my passport, my COVID passport. I'll do whatever the government asks me as long as I get my government check. But what I'm saying is what happens when that thing bounces or doesn't, or the purchasing power isn't that much, then we'll have to see, you know, what will happen then. My opinion is, Slaves aren't productive. We'll have to decide. We'll have to see if the establishment wants a productive, a productive society or a slave-type society. I think some countries will go one way. 
or regions of countries will go one way, other countries will go the other way, or regions. In other words, I'm suggesting there'll be succession in some countries even, or ungovernable areas in some countries. I basically believe the Western world, all over the world, Eastern world, everywhere the establishment is under attack. I believe they're going to do anything they can to try to stay in power. And I believe ultimately they won't really be successful. And most of the world will decentralize. I'm basically a Martin Gurry fan in that I see his view. His view isn't always optimistic either. That's why I'm not trying to paint a pretty picture. When things decentralize, it can be good or it can be bad. As the establishment loses influence and legitimacy, you could see warlord-type situations in some parts of the world and maybe decentralization in other parts of the world where there's more cooperation and productivity. That's what I think is going to happen in some Commonwealth countries or a potential for that. And I could see that potential even in places like Switzerland, Liechtenstein, or parts of the United Kingdom, um, possibly Eastern Europe, possibly places I haven't really thought of, and, and but parts of Africa too. Parts of, parts of Asia, I, I think it's possible, but it's hard for me to see that, but we'll see. But I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm predicting, I'm a very good predictor of anything. Another thread I was watching tonight was Bjorn. I'm trying to think of his channel. I can't think of him, but he's, he's, he's a Norwegian. He's more of a traditional type, conservative type dude. And he, he just made a video on, on all this coronavirus where the establishment, the government just saying, you need to do what we tell you. You need to pay more taxes. You need to accept the lockdowns. And you need to accept the fact that we're going to get most of the loot and you're going to be locked down. In other words, we're, we, the establishment, we're going to, we're going to continue our lifestyle traveling, spending our, your tax dollars, and you're going to, you're going to pay increased taxes. You're going to stay locked down and you're going to lose your business. He, he basically was talking about that. And what I like about his video is it seems like people accept that. That's what's depressing. It seems like people accept that. So as more and more people see that dichotomy or that, you know, the establishment has one set of rules and we have to follow another set of rules that aren't good for us. And they don't really have to follow any rules. They can get away with whatever they want, even if there's a so-called uh, pandemic going on. I even just saw recently today, as a matter of fact, that Angela Merkel didn't want to take the vaccine. She said she wasn't going to take the vaccine. <laughs> That's good optics. Anyways, that's my my little video for tonight. I just don't have a lot of solutions for people except for you. We're going through some kind of transition and you're going to have, have to have skills that aren't the traditional type skills to survive whatever this transition we're going through. As a suggestion, an idea, um, having a few gold coins, having some cash saved up is still useful. But what's even more useful is having marketable skills that you can sell and trade with people. Things you can grow and trade with people. Um, cash, cash, like in your pocket cash. It's way more anonymous than Bitcoin. Trading your cash, trading your gold or silver coin. It's going to be way more anonymous than Bitcoin. Uh, trading your cash and Bitcoin to, to learn new skills is another thing. At some point, if the governments keep inflating the money, so it could lead to a lot of inflation where the purchasing power of your cash won't be as much as it used to be. So having skills you can use to trade to get what you want is going to be maybe more valuable than, than a job. Maybe not as valuable. It depends on what your job is, but it'll be valuable enough that if you have that skill, you'll survive and prosper better than people who don't have a valuable skill to trade. And I think there's going to be a lot. I think in the transition, there's a potential for there to be a lot of unemployment, like 20 or 30 percent of the population, that kind of unemployment. I don't know how that will affect things, but I don't imagine it will affect things in a good way. So... So that's where I'm 
kind of in such unprecedented times because the technology used to be in the past. You could just leave and go to another land. Even three or four hundred years ago, you could do that. There were places around the world where gold was actual money. There were places around the world where government didn't tax more than five or ten percent of the economy. So you could just move somewhere else and start up your little shop, hire yourself out as a laborer, and, and do okay. Those days are kind of over, so it's, it's kind of interesting, exciting, and frightening all at the same time. So those are my thoughts on, the, on this topic. You know the drill. Like, share, subscribe. Stay awesome.